happy to be able to introduce our guest speaker. Thanks. I was supposed to remind him to do that. <laughs> um, yeah, so tonight's speaker is Risa Conway. And Risa has been an avian researcher with Colorado Parks and Wildlife since 2012. Based in Fort Collins, she focuses on grassland birds and raptors statewide. Risa leads research projects on bald eagle populations and habitat use in the rapidly developing Colorado Front Range. Uh, survey design and population status of golden eagles and other priority raptors statewide, and avian response to plague management on prairie dog colonies. Before joining CPW, Risa worked as a wildlife biologist for Bird Conservancy in the Rockies and a postdoctoral researcher at the U.S. Geological Survey Fort Collins Science Center. Risa got her BA from Dartmouth College an MS from the University of Montana, and PhD from Colorado State University. When she isn't working, she's wrangling her two elementary age sons, tending her garden, <laughs> listening to audiobooks while doing tours, or planning post-COVID travels. Uh, Lisa, I will mask up and hand this over to you. Hello, everybody in the room and everybody on Zoom land. Um, can you guys on Zoom hear me and see me okay? Somebody say in the chat if it's good or not good, <laughs> but I'm going to assume it's good. Okay, awesome. All right, so. Great. Well, thank you, Jesse, and thanks, John, for um, inviting me and, and coordinating this tonight. So as John said, I'm going to be talking to you guys about uh, Front Range Bald Eagles and the research that Colorado Parks and Wildlife, uh, along with our partners, in particular Bird Conservancy of the Rockies, started about a year and a half ago. Okay, I swear I did not hit that button. It just advanced by itself. Um, so uh, the, the title is Bald Eagles in Our Backyard, uh, Population Trends, Habitat Use, and Human Impacts on Colorado's Front Range Eagles. And before I get into the research project itself, I just want to put this into context for you guys. So this is a screenshot of our, our statewide raptor nest database. And so it's pretty impressive. It goes back to 1975. And of course, we have data on more species than just bald eagles. We've got data on 30 different nesting raptors, uh, 30 species of raptors in over 11,000 locations. Um, so this is not available to the public. Folks always ask me this um, because obviously we don't want to reveal sensitive nesting locations, especially if they're on, on private lands. But in terms of how these data are used, um, CPW is asked to do land use consultations. So we do give our data yearly now to the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission, and they use that in their um, decision making. And then of course, cities and counties, partners, um, project planners and developers can request data for their project areas so that they can avoid impacts on raptors. And the idea is that um, folks will follow our buffer guidelines and we can avoid any new ground disturbance within a certain distance of nests. There it went again, I did not hit that button. <laughs> um, also statewide assessments. So um, the, the bald, bald species bald eagle is one that we have a lot of data on, especially in the front range. And so we can do a little more with those data than we can for the other species across the state. Um, so 
this project, we are looking at productivity. We're also looking at trends of bald eagles nesting on the front range. Um, statewide, that's a little more difficult because the data we have are presence only data. So that means we don't have broad scale survey data where people are noting both presence and absence or non-detection. Um, and of course, from 1975 to today, effort has varied over space and time. Um, but we have recently put out some distribution models, which should be published in the Journal of Rapid Research in December. And the, the picture or the, the diagram on the left shows the distribution model we came up with for bald eagles. We also worked on ferruginous hawks, golden eagles, and prairie falcons. So getting into the research on bald eagles in particular, um, our objective was to assess the bald eagle population and how they're using habitat in this rapidly changing human dominated landscape of the Colorado Front Range. So we started this project in 2020 and we expect it to go through 2024. And our project area is from the Denver metro area all the way north up to the Wyoming border and east as far as Greeley. So we've got four major goals, and I'll just go over the, the major methods that we're using for each of these goals. So we're trying to estimate breeding success, and that's via direct observations of nests. And most of these aren't being made by CPW staff. They're actually made by volunteers, especially with Bird Conservancy of the Rockies, Bald Eagle Watch, um, CPW volunteers, especially in our state parks, and, um, and others. We've got... Uh, various open spaces, um, city staff, county staff that do their own raptor monitoring um, as well. So we've got lots of great partners on this project. Um, and then number two, we're trying to quantify human related disturbances. And again, some of that comes from nest observations, but some of it comes from uh, GIS layers and uh, spatial analyses. And then third, we're trying to analyze movements and habitat use. And we're doing that from more rural to more urban areas using transmitters that we've, we've been putting on bald eagles. And then of course, the fourth goal is that we wanna inform conservation and land management to benefit our bald eagle population. So just a little bit of background, um, bald eagle numbers reached their low in the 1960s and that was largely due to the insecticide DDT that affected many species, not just eagles, but it made their eggshells very thin. Um, it, in the 1970s, our, our biologist, Jerry Craig, he was, he was the raptor biologist, uh, raptor researcher for CPW for, for many years, um, considered Colorado to be only peripheral in terms of nesting habitat for bald eagles. And he was monitoring bald eagles um, in the 1970s, but there were very few. Uh, there were only one to three or four active nests per year during the 1970s. Um, but DDT was banned in 1972 and bald eagles were protected uh, under the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act as well as the Endangered Species Act. And these are Jerry's data. So this comes from a 1998 report that he wrote. And so you can see this very gradual increase over time. Um, the graph ends in 97 because he retired shortly thereafter. Um, but he was mostly monitoring golden eagles um, because as I said, there weren't very many bald eagles in the state for him to work on at the time. Um, but he did, he did monitor some bald eagle nests and he did some nest stabilization work. Um, so in 1986, the Far Lake nest was actually the first um, front range bald eagle nest in the state, at least for, for a long time, post DDT. In 1988, um, Bird Conservancy the Rockies Bald Eagle Watch program was founded largely to follow up on that nest, but they, they expanded to, to monitoring other nests as well. And for those of you who are familiar with Bar, Bar Lake um, and know that, that the bald eagle nest that used to be visible from the gazebo um, blew down the tree came down this year um, and tomorrow actually they're putting up some new nest baskets that are the same design. In fact, one of them I think is the exact same one that Jerry um, helped to put up decades ago. 
So this comes from a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service report that came out last year, and it just shows that in the last decade, the bald eagle population in the contiguous United States has increased quite a bit. So it appears that we've got four times the number of bald eagles and two times the number of nesting pairs since 2009. And that's pretty much um, the trend uh, nationwide in the contiguous states. Okay, so this graph goes back to where Jerry's graph started, but then it continues on through 2020. And so the blue line is statewide and the red line is the Northern Front Range counties where we're doing our research. So um, these are just known nests that we know there probably are nests that we're not aware of or, or maybe we became aware uh, a year or two after they were actually established. So we consider this to be an index and not an actual population estimate. And not all nests were monitored in all years. Um, but you can see what looks like exponential growth um, that really started to take off in the 90s and 2000s. So the front range of Colorado, um, everybody knows, is growing really rapidly. So it's grown 18% um, human population since 2000. And the front range is expected to host most of Colorado's future growth. Um, with urban development, there are pluses and minuses to species like bald eagles. And so the minuses are kind of obvious. We've got less native habitat um, that's encroaching more on natural areas. We have fewer black-tailed prairie dogs, which um, are just one species that, that bald eagles, um, the bald eagles eat, but they're important in the wintertime. So um, fish, you can imagine, are, are perhaps less available in the wintertime if uh, water freezes, whereas prairie dogs don't hibernate, black-tailed prairie dogs don't hibernate, so they're an important food resource in the winter. But the plus side of all this is that humans need water, and so we have built reservoirs, and we've got um, cottonwood trees growing up around those reservoirs that are good nesting habitat for bald eagles. So the vast majority of bald eagles in the state of Colorado are nesting in cottonwood trees, although they do use other substrates as well. And so sometimes people ask me, well, if bald eagles are doing so well, why are you guys doing research on them instead of another species? Um, but the reason for that, at least part of the reason for that, um, is that we are interested in what this, con this continuing development will do to our eagles and how we can help them continue to be successful. So um, comparing different types of development, whether it be energy development or housing, um, you know, solar versus wind, oil versus oil and gas, you know, what's, what has the most impact? What might eagles tolerate, actually tolerate quite well? So that we can make appropriate recommendations um, to all of our partners. And just as one example, um, I spoke to one of my colleagues in the Northeast region of CPW and asked him, well, how often do you have to respond to a concern about bald eagles? And he said, this is just one staff member, he said every other day. So for our agency, we're getting a lot of, um, a lot of calls about bald eagles. Okay, so just in terms of our first goal, and by the way, if anybody wants to interrupt with questions, you guys can go ahead and do that. I mean, we can do it at the end if you want, but I'm- If people do ask questions, can you repeat them? Yes, I will repeat them if they're in the room. And if they're not in the room, do you, I don't know how you guys want to handle that. Okay. <laughs> okay, so um, in terms of the nest monitoring, um, nests are monitored at least every two weeks, sometimes more frequently. And there's a lot of stuff that the volunteers are writing down and our staff people are writing down, um, including the status of the nest, if it's occupied or not, um, the behavior of both adults and juveniles, if they are seen, as well as um, sources of disturbance that the nest monitor might notice. So that could be anything from barking dogs to hikers or bicyclists. It could be machinery, it could be um, construction activity. Um, and they're also, of course, trying to, to get uh, information on those important events, like when initiation, uh, nest initiation starts. So that would be when 
um, when eggs are laid and the eagles start incubating, when eggs hatch, um, and then trying to track the age of eaglets until they fledge. And this, this effort started um, long before our research started. And so we're also interested in creating nest histories, looking back in time at some of those previous years of data, and then putting those together with the spatial data to look at how land use has impacted um, nest activity and productivity over time. And in case you're wondering, this picture, um, it's from the Excel Energy Bald Eagle webcam. And so this is a picture from March of last year when we had that really big snowstorm that dumped like two feet. Um, it was pretty interesting actually <laughs> to watch this and get reports back from the folks monitoring our nests. Because of course by then, bald eagles were, were almost all on eggs. And most of the nests actually survived this. Yeah, including that one. <laughs> so this is looking back to 2016. Um, so Bird Conservancy's Bald Eagle Watch feels that 2016 um, was a year when they kind of revamped their protocols a little bit. We can look back further in time than that, but that's when the protocols became more similar to what they are now. So that's why I'm showing back that far on the graph. And so the, the top left figure shows the numbers of nests. Um, so the blue line is the numbers of um, structures that were, were monitored. And then the red line is the numbers of nests that were actually initiated. So bald eagles and golden eagles also actually will often have more than one structure that they're building and tending. Um, and of course, they're only going to nest in, in one at a time. Um, so last year, we had 97 nests actually initiated in our front range study area. Um, and then the, the bottom figure shows nest success. And so the reason there are two lines there is just because of some uncertainty. Um, so in previous years, we had a high and a low estimate. And in recent years, those two are really converging. So you see um, in 2021, um, they converged on 79% uh, um, apparent nest survival rate. So that doesn't come from modeling. It's just from folks going out every couple of weeks and, and watching. So the second goal I, um, I noted already was to quantify human related disturbances as well as how the eagles respond to those. Um, and and that's really important because in a lot of cases, um, some of our pairs seem pretty tolerant of the activities that they're accustomed to. And so we've got um, the gamut of responses from nothing, like they appear to completely ignore what's going on around them, to um, you know alarm calling or flushing from the nest. Um, we would consider a uh, juvenile that was really too young to fledge if it flushed from the nest to be like the most severe response. Um, and so they're noting kind of short-term or acute threats like, like the barking dogs um, to more long-term kind of habitat modification. So tree clearing or construction projects, that kind of thing that, that permanently modifies habitat. And then the other piece of that beyond the observations that I mentioned was doing some spatial analyses. And so this is just a first effort at a development index across these front range counties. And so if you go from left to right, um, these are decadal looks at the front range and the light colored pixels are the more developed pixels. And so you can see you go from more of the darker red tones to more of the brighter white tones. Um, the bright white dots are bald eagle nests and so in 1990, most of the bald eagle nests were in the darker red area, and now they're mostly in the more developed pixels. And this index came from uh, seven different layers that I've listed here. So there's oil and gas, solar and wind energy, wind energy transmission lines, trails, roads, and then residential and commercial development. And that's something we're still working on. Um, so for example, we don't have aquatic recreation in here. And there's some other things that we want to do to make this better and more informative, but I think it still paints a picture of what's going on. So the third thing we're trying to do is to study movement and habitat use. And the reason we wanted to put transmitters on birds is because if you're just observing nests, you're only aware of what's happening at the nest and maybe the immediate area. 
with the birds that you can see. But obviously they are moving around um, beyond that. Um, and so we started, our, we put our first transmitter out in July of 2020, and we were hoping to get 20 to 30 transmitters out. So we were successful our very first time out, and I thought, great, this is gonna be easier than I thought, because um, I'd heard horror stories about how hard it is to catch a bald eagle. And it advanced again. <laughs> it, must, it must be stat static electricity or something. Um, anyway, then it took us another three months to catch our second bird. And then we didn't catch another bird until May of this year, actually. So they are wily um, creatures. But um, all of a sudden, it was like we flipped a switch on May 15th of this year. Um, and I'm assuming that it's because they had kind of older nestlings, um, kind of like a bunch of hungry teenagers in your house, and they were more stretched for food, so it was perhaps more worth it to them to take the risk of coming down to our base. Um, but anyway, we got 15 more transmitters on between May and August of this year. So we were up to 17 transmitters, um, pretty evenly split between males and females. So we had seven of each um, adults, and then we put transmitters on three juveniles as well. They're solar powered, so there's a, a solar panel that covers the whole upper surface of the transmitter. Um, and they're intended to stay on for two to five years, not forever. The study is only a four to five year study, so there was no reason that a species that can live in the wild for 30 years should have to carry this forever. So they're backpack, they're put on with the backpack harness. And the idea is that the, the threading on the breast will wear eventually and the whole unit will slide off. Um, we're hoping that they'll stay on for four or five years. We have yet to have one come off thus far. So these transmitters communicate with the cellular network rather than pinging off of satellites, they ping off of cell towers. Um, and that has its advantages and disadvantages. The main advantage is that we can get tons more data. So, um, you know, back in the day, you'd be doing well to get one or two locations a day, but we can get locations at least um, when the sun is high and we're close, closer to the summer solstice versus the winter solstice. We can get locations like every four seconds while the bird is moving. So that's a ton of data. Um, and it allows the units to be smaller because they're communicating with um, cell towers instead of satellites. So this is actually a release of a bird um, near Fort Collins. So like I said, we had 17 units that we put out and the figure on the left shows where those units were in August. And I know it looks like they're in Wyoming, but they were actually um, mostly in Colorado. Um, but the scale is kind of off because we had one of our juveniles take off and go up to Saskatchewan and Manitoba about a week um, after she was tagged. So, so since that, that picture was a little bit hard to process, I zoomed in on the breeding population on the right, it shows where our 13 breeders were tagged. As you can see, it's, it's, it pretty much covers our, our project area from the Denver metro area north. Um, so we did have 17 units out, but I mean, it wasn't totally unexpected that we would have some mortalities. So just in the past month, we lost one of our breeding females when she got electrocuted on a power pole. So we think that's probably a pretty common source of mortality for eagles in more urban and suburban areas, unfortunately. That was a bummer. Um, and then just a couple weeks ago, we lost one of the juveniles. Um, there's our necropsy team is still processing some of the samples, but it looks like she she'd been in Wyoming for quite a while, and um, she's we did recover her and her transmitter, and she has probably starved to death, but we don't know why. We don't know if if um, it was disease or um, lead or you know a toxin like that. Or sometimes um, young birds just fail to thrive. You know, they do okay as long as their parents are feeding them. And then when they're out on their own, they just aren't able to successfully feed themselves. So we don't know, and we may or may not ever know exactly what the reason was for that. Um, but we still have 15 units live um, as of today. And so just to show you what I mean about the really frequent data, um, 
these are data from one of our adult territorial males who has a nest in the Denver metro area. And so these locations cover about two and a half days for him. And so you can see what the, the flight mode data that are collected up to every, couple, every four or five seconds look like. And so that's an advantage for us because um, we can see just exactly where he was foraging, how he was moving between um, perch sites and foraging locations. And eventually when we put all these data together, we can see whether there are certain areas that they like to be in, they like to fly through or over and certain areas that they avoid. So it's pretty cool. It's pretty addictive to look at these data every day. I spend a lot of my time doing that. Um, and then this is that juvenile female that I mentioned that she, she took off about a week after we tagged her and she dispersed up into Canada. So the left-hand graph shows her northward journey. So it took her about five days to get from the front range of Colorado up to the US-Canadian border. And then another five days for her to get up to the Lake Winnipeg region. And then we lost track of her for three months. Um, so with the, the, the cellular units, another disadvantage I think I forgot to mention was that they have to be within cell range. They have to be near enough to a cell tower to actually transmit their data back. So they're not live data. Um, I get a download every 24 hours, assuming the bird is within cell range. So she obviously was not within cell range. Um, we actually thought she might've died and we would never get the transmitter back. Um, but on October 30th, um, we got a whole bunch of locations <laughs> um, downloaded to us. And shortly after that, she started moving back down to the US border, it took her two weeks um, to do that. And then since then, she's continued to move down through the Dakotas and she's she's been hanging out for a couple of days now um, in South Dakota. So it'll be interesting to see where she spends the winter and whether she continues to disperse up to Canada or whether she sticks around. Bald eagles don't typically breed until they're five years old. Um, she won't have her adult plumage until then. And we know that juvenile birds tend to move around a lot. So I'm anxious to see where she goes next. So just an example of um, what we've done so far, it's just really preliminary, but the figure on the left, the darker purple are areas where we had a higher density of locations. So that's an area where this territorial female was spending more of her time. And then the lighter the color, um, the less time. So it's kind of more peripheral um, breeding area. So this was from July to October. So it's, it's kind of late nesting and post nesting period. And this is a time when we've been seeing our breeding birds um, head off and take a vacation. In particular, the females leave earlier and stay away longer than the males do. Um, and then they come back. So at this point, most of our birds, our, our breeding birds are back close to their nest sites again. But the juveniles for the most part have not come back. Um, and then the one on the right, the blue polygon at the bottom is a minimum convex polygon. So it connected um, all of her locations from July into October of 2020. Other than the, the yellow line represents um, a trip that she took up to Wyoming. So this is the first bird we had tagged. And so it was really surprising to us when all of a sudden she took off for Wyoming. She stayed for three days before she came back. And she has since made this similar trip about six or seven times. Um, and I mean, she's back at her nest in between or she's at other locations within her territory. So in terms of that fourth goal, um, we did put out a news release in July. So if anybody wants to find more information, um, you don't actually have to write down this whole link. Um, you can just Google search CPW bald eagle study, and it'll take you to the news release. And there are um, some pictures and some text, as well as at the bottom, you see the, the blue text. Those are links to a podcast episode and a video that we did about the research project. We've also put out some social media posts and done some presentations, which I'm happy to do just to spread the word about um, bald eagles and uh, what we're working on. And we do have a lot more work to do, of course. We've got three more years of work and I really wanna get out um, the rest of our transmitters and get some more good information. Yeah? We have a question on the previous slide. Yeah. Uh, any idea why she is driving the Wyoming on the ridge? Please repeat the question. 
Yeah, now I can't get it to go backwards. <laughs> Should I try again? Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, no, I don't know why she was going to Wyoming because all I really know is where she was, not what she was doing there. Um, so, you know, a lot of our birds have actually gone up to the Laramie area, southwest of Laramie along the Laramie River, and then to a couple of fairly big res reservoirs a little bit to the north of there. So it's possible that that's why she was there. I mean, it's also possible that she hatched up in Wyoming. And, you know, even though she's breeding in Colorado, it doesn't mean that she actually was born in Colorado. Um, although we did tag one bird actually in the Fort Collins area who it turns out he was banded already and he actually hatched from the, the, um, the St. Brain, the Fort St. Brain nest. So, yeah, and I, so the answer is no, I don't know why she went up there. <laughs> Um, well, it's get it's so it's 10 till. I don't know if you want me to take some more questions or if you want to show maybe a clip of that video. Okay. So there's plenty of time for questions and the video. Okay. Whatever you want to do. Cool. Well, I have a video to share, but if you guys have any questions, I'd rather maybe answer a couple questions before and then we can we can either show the whole eight-minute video or there's like a two-minute clip that I thought might be interesting that shows some animations of the, the spatial data that we've gotten back from our transmitters. And it also shows some video clips of um, a bird actually being tagged. Okay, does anybody have questions? Uh-huh. Um, how did you tell the difference between the males and the females? The females are a lot bigger. Um, so it's, it's kind of hard to tell if you're just viewing them unless you see them side by side. But the females are like 20, 20 to 25% bigger than the males. Right, but when you, when you capture them, you have two different With the measurements, yeah. So um, the their talons are longer, so we measure the hallux claw, and it's definitely pretty diagnostic, as well as even just the weight is pretty diagnostic. Um, most of our males were closer to four kilograms and our females were closer to five. Um, but we, we weren't, CPW wasn't doing this like totally on its own. We actually hired a former Fish and Wildlife Service um, guy who's trapped eagles for 30 years, um, who's super, super experienced to help us out with all of this. And he can tell without even taking any measurements like immediately whether he's got a male or a female. Uh -huh. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll repeat the next one. <laughs> yeah, the question was how we do the trapping. Um, so we use um, a, a dead bait. So cottontail rabbits, jackrabbits. If it's a more aquatic site, we've got fish um, or waterfowl that we can use. Um, and we have to put them in areas where we think the birds are gonna see them. So um, of course we're familiar with these nest sites and we always talk to the person who monitors the nest to see what the most frequently used perches are. And then that morning we see where the birds are hanging out um, in order to decide where to put the baits and the trap. Um, the trap itself is a modified leg hold trap. So um, it is, uh, it's modified to lower the pan tension and it's padded so that it won't hurt the bird. And then we've got people watching, but we've also got a game camera that um, we can look at the pictures from a cell phone so that we can get a really good view um, and know like immediately if a bird is trapped. And then we hood the bird, which I mean, if anybody's handled raptors, it's a pretty typical thing to do to tether their legs and to hood them. And, most of them, I'd say all but one has been pretty calm. Um, and even the other one was calm most of the time um, that we had her in hand. Um, oh, and the, the, so the, the trapper that we work with from Fish and Wildlife Service, um, he told us that they like to face into the wind when they're feeding. And so the bait is on the side of the trap where we think that the eagles are gonna I should, yeah, so that, so that they'll be pointed the right way. 
So they could come into the bait, and if they just stand on the wrong side of it and don't happen to they don't happen to stand on that light pole trap, we won't get them. And that's definitely happened plenty of times <laughs> that we've watched them consume like a whole rabbit um, and not get trapped. But it works better than than you would expect it to most of the time. We have an online question. Okay. Uh, do you observe periodic road trips to Wyoming and Canada, for example, among both females and males? So we only ever had that one juvenile go up to Canada. The, the question is whether um, there's a difference between adults and juveniles and, and males and females in terms of those longer trips that they take. So the, the really long trip was just the juvenile. And although it kind of shocked us to see it at first, um, we looked through the literature and saw that um, bald eagles in other states, once they fledge and disperse, it's not that unusual for them to go even as far up to Canada. Um, but our other juveniles only went as far as Wyoming. So everybody's gone north, and that's true of our adult birds too. Um, the only birds that have left the state have all gone north into Wyoming or further. Um, and yeah, we have had we have had adult females, like the one that I showed you, this one, um, who went up into Wyoming. I don't think any of our adult males have left Colorado, but they have left the Front Range. When they do that, mostly they go into the mountains to the west and kind of cruise around before coming back. Um, one of our birds that's in the Aurora area has made a trip down around Pikes Peak um, a couple of times. Um, but our, so we only have one juvenile male tagged and he also went up into Wyoming. So actually all three of our juveniles went to Wyoming and then that one continued even further north. Yeah. Um, well, they stay surprisingly still. Uh, that, so how do we get them to stay still after we trap them? Um, and yeah, they stay surprisingly still once they're once they're hooded. So it's a special hood that comes from falconry. It's a leather hood. Um, and we also try to have an appropriate noise level. So we're not going to be shouting or laughing. And actually, white noise that you know a lot of people think kind of helps them sleep um, seems to help as well. So um, just a level of background noise, like um, music from the radio. Um, seems to be helpful. We do have a towel that sometimes we can put over the bird while it's being processed. Um, but mostly they're pretty good until we're getting ready to release them and we pop the hood off again. And that's when we have to be more careful because <laughs> <laughs> they, they can sense that their time has come. <laughs> Other questions? Uh -huh. uh, you mentioned that um, a lot of the consultation uh, Together, you guys is for um, uh, includes referring people to buffers. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, buffer dogs. Yeah, the buffer distances are, are different for each species of raptor, and it's based on um, either CPW's experience or the literature of um, how wide of an area they use for their home range as well as at what distance away. Um, they tend to respond to sources of disturbance. And so for some species, it's half a mile. For other species, it's a smaller distance. Um, and that's basically just a circular distance, these buffers um, around the nest. And there's some seasonality to them. Um, so we don't want, if, if at all possible, it's, if it's avoidable, um, we would like folks to try to um, avoid any new infrastructure, any new um, above ground um, permanent infrastructure all the time. Um, if there are things that have to be done, like maintaining infrastructure that's already there, you know, going in and maintaining irrigation equipment or whatnot, um, we have a seasonal human activity um, restriction, but CPW isn't able to, to really regulate or enforce those. So um, all we can do is provide consultation and advice. Um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has management authority and regulatory authority for both bald and golden eagles. But for the most part, I mean, folks want to do the right thing. Um, and I think most, most people try. 
Um, but it also makes a difference whether um, those potential sources of disturbance in that infrastructure um, has been there at the same time, you know, perhaps it predated the nest even versus something new coming in. So, um, you know, if we have eagles nesting in an area that's already built out, obviously we can't undo that. Um, and for the most part, they seem to, to tolerate those things better. I mean, that's one of our hypotheses that, um, that pre-existing development will have a different impact, a less, less of an impact than new development that's new to that pair and new to that area. And we also expect a difference between more rural and more urban sites. If actually, if you want to see what all of those are, you can go on CPW's website and find that. Yeah. Uh -huh. Are there um, federal uh, or state regulations or penalties if a private landowner takes down an active a tree with an active nest in it? So yeah. Eagles or hawks or whatever. So um, the question is whether there's a penalty if a private landowner um, purposely takes down a nest, a raptor nest. And so, um, yeah, there, that would be considered nest take and there could be a penalty, a financial penalty. Um, they can apply for a permit in certain cases. Um, and then just depending, depending on their circumstances, there could be some mitigation that is required to be done. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's definitely not something that folks are supposed to do. That would be up to the Fish and Wildlife Service to enforce those kinds of violations. And hopefully they are uncommon, but <laughs> yeah. We had an incident with a developer taking down all old growth hot woods and some of them would have wrapped their nests in them. So I, I can't really speak to what the penalty would be for other species. Um, right now, Fish and Wildlife Service has more penalties for golden eagles than for bald eagles, just because golden eagles continue to, to struggle and they seem to react more to, to human disturbance than bald eagles do. Um, but I mean, if, if there was direct take of a bald eagle nest and somebody took down uh, an active nest tree, I mean, Theoretically, there should be a penalty for that that the Fish and Wildlife Service would be responsible for. A couple online. So the first one, uh, what can you tell us about the migratory behavior for front range bald eagles? So the question is um, what we know about the migratory behavior of front range bald eagles. So we haven't actually analyzed all our data yet across all of our birds, and I think we're going to get more transmitters on next year. So this is just kind of anecdotal from my like obsessive viewing of um, our data portal. Um, but the, the birds, certainly while their nests are active and why, while they still have nestlings, um, they're sticking around the nest pretty closely. Um, but the females, the breeding females tend to head out sooner than the breeding males do. So um, we know that sometimes the male is still feeding um, fledged juveniles when the female takes a little break. Um, sometimes they're just gone for a couple of days. So like um, this bird on her yellow colored path here, she was just gone for three days that time in September. Um, but sometimes they're gone for longer. Um, this same bird, when she did come back to her territory, instead of being every day at her nest, she hung out about four miles to the northwest of her nest at a reservoir. Um, the males have been taking, I would say, shorter trips and have been gone a little bit less than the females. But um, I, would, I would say these are just kind of temporary trips that they're taking rather than actual migration because they're, I think for the most part, territorial breeding birds are present in their nest ter territories almost year round. At the same time that we have, I mean, I'm sure you guys are aware, we have lots more bald eagles here in the winter because they're coming from other places and they're wintering in Colorado. But at the same time that we have those um, migratory and wintering bald eagles in Colorado, we still have our, our territorial breeding birds present here, at least in the front range um, that we've seen. 
none of our breeding adults have just taken off and gone somewhere else. Was the bird on the yellow path traveling the whole three days? Traveling the whole three days, or did she stop? Uh, I think that she, I think that she made the trip all the way up there within the first day. And then she moved around a little bit for a couple of days. Actually, we had a little snafu with um, her transmitter. And the reason the lines don't connect up there at the northern part of her trip was that we um, we lost, uh, I don't know, maybe a couple hours to a day's worth of her data before she came back. But she went up pretty quickly. She kind of hung around for a couple of days, and then she came back pretty quickly as well. I mean, they can fly pretty fast, pretty far, pretty fast. So, I mean, that's not so, so far. She she did that, in a, I think, in a couple hours, actually. Got all the way up there. Another one from Zoom? Yeah. Uh, what is the average number of eggs laid in a nest and the number that actually fled? So the question is how many eggs are laid and then how many typically fledge? So um, bald eagles can lay anywhere from one to three eggs. Typically it's two or three. And um, often, sometimes all, all of them hatch. Sometimes there's one that doesn't end up hatching. Um, in terms of fledging, if you look at the literature, it suggests that two is fairly common, one is also fairly common, and three almost never happens. So still, if you look at um, Cornell's Birds of the World, which, you know, it's, it's bald eagle populations everywhere, not just Colorado. Um, and I think that they suggest that it's only like three or four percent of nests that actually fledge um, three eaglets successfully. But in the front range, what we're seeing is that um, it's more like maybe 50 or 60% of successful nests end up fledging too. You know, maybe it's 25, 30% will fledge one, but it seems like around 15% or so, of course it varies from year to year, um, actually fledge all three. So it's not really that, that uncommon here to see all three eggs successfully um, hatch and fledge. Do the uh, do the resident bald eagles roost in the same in, in their nest trees even when they're not nesting season? They they do. So the question is whether um, when it's not the breeding season, whether our breeding birds are still roosting in the nest trees or whether they're going someplace else to roost. And it varies. So when they're not when they're not actively incubating or brooding or tending young nestlings, even during the summer. Sometimes they're not spending the night in their nest tree. Um, sometimes they're they're typically somewhere fairly close. Um, so during the winter time, during the fall, winter, and winter time, um, when we're outside of the breeding season, they're not always roosting in the nest tree, but they are sometimes. Most of our birds come back every day to every couple of days at least, although they don't necessarily spend a ton of time there. But they it, it appears that they have kind of their favorite spots. Um, and they might visit those spots some during the nesting season, but not as often as they do um, outside of the nesting season. We have a couple of comments. Um, one just saying, um, could you put the website up for a couple of minutes? And I've asked for clarification on the website. Yeah. Yeah, so this is the website for the for the news release, but again, if people just search CPW Bald Eagle Study, it'll take you to the same spot. Um, and then and then you'll get to this page actually. This is just a screenshot of that page, um, which is the press release we put out in July. And then it's got those links to both the podcast. And um, the video, it's the same video that I was going to show to you guys. And we certainly have time for that if there are no other questions. Okay, yeah, I mean, then if you guys have questions after the video, you're welcome to ask them. I will just say one thing before, um, do you, so do you want to just show the whole thing? Yeah. Okay, so we can just show the whole eight minute thing. I'll just, I'll, I'll list one little erratum 
at the start, it's about the Bar Lake nest, the one where they're going to put the, the site where they're going to put the um, nest baskets up tomorrow. So um, in the video, I think I say something about that nest dating back to the 2000s, but that, the, two, the, the nest, so the nest from the 2000s was the most recently used locations, but over time, obviously, nest trees have blown down, nests have blown out of trees. So the first nest at Bar Lake was in 1986. So, yeah, I just don't want to do a disservice to Bar Lake State Park for um, actually being the first, the first spot to host a, a bald eagle nest in the Front Range post DDT. Who is Joyce Connery? <laughs> Joyce Connery is my mother-in-law. After she retired from being an educator, she took up the habit of wildlife photography. So this is a picture that she took of our lake, actually. <laughs> Switch to a video? Uh, sure. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Mm -hmm. oh. I have to do this. houses 
then we've got others that are still pretty isolated out on a piece of farmland that probably hardly ever see people. So it kind of runs the gamut. And that's part of the reason we're doing the research study here. We've got um, increasing eagles and we've got increasing human population. And um, while it seems like we've got a successful eagle population, there's also the potential for some conflict. And we want to make sure that our eagles continue to be successful and are managed properly. We wanted to be able to follow individual bald eagles to see where they're foraging, what areas they might be avoiding. We've got some nests in this area, despite it being the front range, some of them that are pretty rural. They might be out on a piece of um, rural farmland. Um, and then we've got other nests that are right in town. So we recently trapped an eagle nesting pretty close to a big parking lot in the Denver metro area. So it kind of runs the gamut. So we're really interested in how bald eagles are using this, this habitat um, that humans are also using and figuring out how we can support our managers and how we can support continued success of our bald eagle population. So the tags we're using for, the, for this study are a relatively new technology. So instead of communicating through the satellite network, they ping off of cell towers. So that allows the tags to be smaller. So they're lighter weight and they're lower profile and that's, that's better for the birds and safer for the birds. And they can give us really frequent locations. So they've got a solar panel on the back. And so um, because they're able to charge while the bird is flying and that solar panel is exposed to the sun, um, they can give us really frequent locations. So these tags have a flight mode and we can get down to about every four seconds. So when you look at a bird's daily track, I mean, it's, it's pretty tight. You can see exactly where that bird foraged, which is great for this study because we can see whether they're using certain areas or whether they're avoiding certain areas um, where there's human development or wind farms or something like that. We were hoping to get these tags on breeding adults, um, adults that are breeding in the front range. And ideally, we'd like to get the tags on the adult male because the female spends more of her time really close to the nest. She, she spends more of her time incubating and brooding and sitting near the nest than the male does. So in terms of the overall territory and where the birds prefer to forage, I think we get a better picture of breeding habitat use if we get tags on the male. But we will happily tag the female as well. They've proved pretty difficult to catch. Um, we were not very successful until May 15th of this year. They're definitely a pretty resilient species. I mean, you can see that just from the nest numbers and how much they've increased in this area over the years. It was once thought to be only peripheral in terms of nesting habitat, and now we've got a really successful population. So a lot of people come to see bald eagles in this part of the state during the winter, so during January, February. But our resident birds, our breeding birds, are actually hanging around their nests year round, and they're starting to lay eggs during that time. And so um, this year we had a huge snowstorm in March, and it dumped about two feet of snow on the front range. And given how exposed their nest sites are, I had expected that we would lose a lot more nests than we did. All those birds persisted and kept incubating through that snowstorm. So we've got two webcams in this part of Colorado. One is the Excel Energy webcam, and the other one is the uh, city of Westminster, the Stanley Lake nest. And so you could watch that and see as the snow piled up around those birds, they stuck tight to the nest and they kept incubating. And I think that's that's pretty amazing.
Yeah, so if you want to see it again, you can go <laughs> online and check it out. Um, but any other questions that came up after that? I thought it would just be cool for you guys to be able to see the um, what it's like when a bird is actually um, in hand and then see some of those animations of the, the location data. No, not usually. I mean, especially when we're sewing or trying to super glue the harness material, it's just the, the work is just too fine, you know, to, to have gloves on. And they're surprisingly calm. I mean, you saw that bird mm -hmm. that was just kind of laying there when it was <laughs> when he was hooded. Um, when no, we no, you know, tranquilizers really aren't used that much for birds. It's a common thing for handling mammals, especially large mammals, but it's not it's not that common for bird for bird work. Um, yeah, it's not until they you take the hood off that they get a little more antsy, and most of them are still okay. Actually, the so Mike Locker, the the he's the contractor I mentioned, and he's the one that you saw at the very end of the video there, taught us that if a bird does start to kind of flap, I mean their wingspan is like six to eight feet, um, and if they do that, you don't want to take the the risk of like messing up their wings or harming them in some way by trying to wrap them back up again while they're doing that. So he taught us just to hold them away from our bodies and let them kind of flip upside down. And then, you know, they flap for a second and, and then when their arc takes them back up again, they usually pull their wings in and you can just sort of grab them back in again. But um, we, don't, we don't take the hood off and everything until we're just about ready to let them go. So the question is, how long is the handling time? Um, and it, it varies. So if we get the harness fit perfect the first time, it's faster. Um, but it's more important with these guys to get the fit just perfect than it is to try to release them really fast. Um, so I think the longest it's taken us is maybe an hour and a half or two hours. So that was a case where, plus you have to you have to wait for the super glue to dry. And the, the glue isn't touching the bird, by the way, it's just touching the harness material. But you have to wait for that to set up um, before it's safe to let them go. Um, and in the meantime, you know, we're, we're putting a band on the leg and we're taking some measurements and doing other things. Um, but the, the times that have taken longer, it's because we've gone through that whole process and we're about ready to let them go. Um, we get the bird up and let it flap a little bit so that we can see if the, the harness moves or if the transmitter slides or if it's really a good position. And we got all that done and um, Mike Lockhart decided he didn't like it and he just took a pair of scissors <laughs> and he cut the whole thing off and started over again. But we want to make sure that that transmitter is exactly in the right spot, not too high, not too low, not too tight, not too loose, um, so that it's comfortable for the bird. All right. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you all for listening. We really appreciate it. My thanks, Teresa. Um